Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I'm the founder of Humanist Learning Systems and the vice president of the International Humanistic Management Association's USA chapter. And I want to welcome you to the Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn today. We appreciate you coming to learn more about how to be a humanistic leader and a humanistic manager. My co-host today is Elizabeth Castillo. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. I'm over at Arizona State University in Tempe, and I am, am the secretary of the International Humanistic Management Association. So thanks for being here today, and I hope you all join us. Great. Our guest today is Dan Hill. He's PhD. He's the author of nine books ranging from Emotionomics, which was heralded by Philip Cotter as a revelation to his latest collaboration with Howard Moskowitz, Blah, 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 a snarky guide to office lingo, which is how I met Dan. <laughs> um, Dan is the founder and president president of Sensory Logic, which pioneered the use of facial coding in business to capture and quantify the emotional responses of customers and employees, and has done work for over 50% of the world's top 100 B2C companies. Dan has been on NBC's The Today Show, ABC's Good Morning America, and received front page profile in the New York Times. Nowadays, he hosts the podcast Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight on the New Books Network, the world's largest book review platform with over 4.5 million downloads monthly. Wow. Um, he's going to talk to us today about emotionomics, though, how to improve engagement, specifically applying emotion EQ to the Zoomosphere meetings. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for letting me join you. So we need to go to the slides, right? So yes. uh, Okay. So let's... Uh try to get there okay so thank you everyone for joining i'm going to be try to be as brief as i can and get what i can covered in 15 minutes because i really enjoy the q a uh most of all I, I did get a question from someone already which was what in the world is emotionomics uh it's a term i coined about 15 years ago based on a, a wonderful quote from someone who said that really in business there are two key currencies Yes, one is dollars, but the other one is emotions. And if you're going to make money in the first case, then you're really going to have to become more emotionally literate, realize the significance of emotions in terms of customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, uh, engagement, being memorable, uh, being motivating, uh, you know, all those things that are really essential to, to human nature and how we function. Uh, it is true, my latest book, blah, 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 probably plays in the fact that I, I believe humor is important to being humanistic. In fact, the Czech writer Milan Kundera said, don't trust any, anyone without a sense of humor. I never met a KGB agent who had one. Uh, something to bear in mind as we watch things unfolding in the Ukraine, for instance, since Putin's a former KGB officer, of course. So um, let's go ahead and jump right in. The this is going to let me get to the next slide hopefully doesn't seem to be moving there we go okay so i think the first thing i wanted to, to lay out regarding today's presentation is the famous color wheel emotional color wheel from robert plutchik uh, because i think a lot of us tend to not think a lot about emotions on a day-to-day -day basis um, and yet there really is a way in which you can structure, organize, think about emotions. And I think this is probably the most accessible model. Uh, there is generally agreement that there's about six or so core emotions, uh, many of which can be captured through facial coding. I'm talking about particularly the ring involving anger and disgust and sadness, surprise, fear and joy. And of course, trust is often called the emotion of business. So. Just in most basic terms, you know, I'm going to be talking about engagement in part because engagement's really, to me, at least when your emotions turn on. Uh, you have to get on someone's radar screen to even get going. And then it becomes a question of what emotions are they feeling? Because in fact, if you go back to Latin, motivation and emotion have the same root word, movere, to move, to make something happen. Without engagement, you're not even in the game at all. And then once you're in the game, what are the emotions you're driving for? I would argue ultimately that's happiness uh, because it's really the one positive emotion out of these core emotions that I'm showing you in the color wheel. And the other one is again, yes, trust is the emotion of business. 
And in the workplace, you know, so much of the work these days is very team oriented. And without trust, you're really not going to have a chance because the opposite of trust is contempt. I don't trust you. I don't respect you. I find you beneath me. Uh, contempt is the most reliable indicator that a marriage will fail. Uh, so it's not surprising that it would not be helpful in a business context as well. So I took something from a, a different book, at least in terms of the two elements to the left here, which is what are some of the challenges that faces, particularly in moving to a virtual or a hybrid model and the factors, and that comes from the book that I cite here on the, on the screen. But I added the column to the right because again, a lot of people don't take this out to the emotional dynamics that are likewise involved. So I'm gonna go through quickly in my 15 minutes, each of these challenges. But I want to just say a few things about the emotional dynamics on the right. So I'm going to be talking about the distractions that happen for us. I'm talking about working from home and the trifecta of things like the refrigerator, uh, taking a nap, seeing what's on TV, et cetera. You know, surprises are really important to keeping people engaged. Your eyes go wider. You're paying attention. You're taking things in. We have an innate desire for some surprises in life. If we can't find them in the work, if we're not learning, if we're not growing, developing, then we're going to look for them elsewhere. Uh, technology. Sometimes we're not well equipped to work from home. Uh, naturally, that's going to lead to frustration. If the frustration builds enough, we're simply going to emotionally disengage. Uh, interfacing in terms of collaboration, communication. Again, the most important thing is probably to stay away from contempt. Uh, I would say a lot of meetings, frankly, are not terribly exciting. Uh, disgust is bad taste, bad smell. What's may be even worse, boredom, no taste at all. Uh, it's the thing to stay away from. Uh, we often have a lack of connection that we find in these virtual or hybrid situations. Sadness as emotion is advantageous in that it makes us ponder things, reflect, maybe come to a better understanding. On the other hand, sadness can also slow us down both physically and mentally and can be a handicap in doing the work well. Uh, Work-life balance, those can be stretched even more in a hybrid or remote situation. Uh, eventually, if they burn us out, they're gonna take us to a really profound level of sadness, uh, grief that kind of you know, robs us of any agency whatsoever. And finally, for a lot of people, when they're not connected to their colleagues, of course, they're gonna worry about their own career path and that can lead to anxiety. So that's kind of the underlying dynamic that I'm gonna be trying to address when I give you some, some tips regarding each of these challenges and ways in which I think you can try to take them on. So the first one is those distractions. And this is a very tactical list, uh, but yes, having a, a set schedule, a calendar, knowing your dead times for most of us, that tends to be later in the day. So that might mean that you will actually wanna move the group meetings, some that are really important, might be in a block of time early in the day, but maybe some should be later in the day and not leave all of your personal time to follow up in the meetings merely to those hours that are your dead times. Uh, because you've got to be aware of what your personal dynamics are, and maybe your teammates can be sensitive to that, and it can work out a whole lot better. Uh, the technological shortfalls, this is also pretty tactical in nature. Obviously, good lighting, a good mic, uh, a virtual background, uh, those are all things that can make it better. In blah, 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 someone actually contributed that uh, one of the problems from working from home is you get to learn a lot more about people's lifestyles than you might necessarily want to know. Uh, one person indicated that they could then see the bong that was on the, on the bookcase behind the uh, manager's desk. Um, so they learned a bit more about the manager than maybe the manager wanted to share. So there are ways you can attend to your attire, your background, your settings, your ability to connect. So these first two are, to my mind, pretty tactical, and I want to move on to ones that I think have a little more emotional substance to them. One of them is getting to communication and collaboration. Uh, human beings are not terribly good at connecting with others. Um, I'm sorry to say that I think part of it is because we are innately rather egocentric. One of my favorite studies that I saw within the last few years is indicated here on the right. Uh, across a number of countries in Europe, they asked them which country had citizens who were the least arrogant and the most compassionate. 
And as you can see, in basically every country, they always said themselves were the best people out there. Um, you know, the only exceptions was Italy allowed that the Spaniards were a little less arrogant. And the same thing happened with the Czechs regarding the Slovaks. Otherwise, supposedly, we always think, you know, we're on top of our game and better than everybody else. So you have to expand your viewpoint. Uh, I think, you know, brevity is good. Give people chances to talk, uh, ask more questions. Uh, in the Devil's Dictionary by Ambrose Bierce, uh, the definition of bore is someone who talks when you want them to listen. I think that is far too often what happens to us in conversations. We are simply waiting for the chance to break in. Uh, that might be rather evident, but if you go back and police yourself and look at, you know, how much that flow goes back and forth, particularly if you're in the managerial role and how much you let people into the conversation and on what terms, it might be rather shocking to realize what's actually transpiring. I think when you're doing virtual or remote meetings, you should go back to understanding how human nature works, how we take in the world. We are really basically, and this goes back to how the brain evolved. We go from sensory impressions to emotional response and essentially rational confirmation. So, you know, huge percentage of the brain is devoted to processing visuals. Uh, one of the things that caused me to write emotionomics and even get into my line of work was that the conservative, the conservative estimation is that 98% of people's mental activity is not fully conscious, 98%. So what we are doing is we're going around assuming the 2% is 100%. We think if we're on message and we're being rational and it's utilitarian, that we're doing a great job of connecting with other people and getting our points across and moving things forward. The fact of the matter is that you have to be on emotion as well. You have to understand people's feelings. You have to give them visuals because people tend to think in imagery, not words. Words are a rather rational medium when it's all said and done. So keeping that perspective in mind, I think can help a lot in terms of being a more successful communicator. You also, particularly on Zoom calls, uh, you want to look at what's central to how people respond to visuals. Uh, I was one of the pioneers of using eye tracking in market research and uh, have done lots of studies over the year. I've also published a book on people's intuitive reactions to famous art. And let me just go through a few of these key points. So people notice what's down the middle. So if you have a key visual and you want it on the screen, don't put it in the peripheral place. People notice motion, quick motion, slow motion, sustained motion, they notice things that are changing because when something is changing, then it's either an opportunity or a threat to the status quo, and it's going to arrest our attention. Is it meaningful? Is it dominant? All of those are important, but I'm here to tell you that faces are hugely important. Uh, we know for most of our studies and advertising and art and so forth, if there is a face involved, it will seize about two thirds to three quarters of people's attention. It is just overwhelmingly the visual vampire that will seize attention. So how you are coming across to others and the information you can share is often much richer and much more realistic than what gets said in a meeting or a conversation, for instance. So to that mind, and having done this kind of work for a long time, uh, these are tactical elements that you might blow right past, but they are actually important. Uh, do you sit at an oblique angle? Uh, do you, are your hands hiding your face? Is the lighting too dark uh, or too light? Are you eating and drinking and therefore people can't see how you're feeling? Uh, if you want to leverage the Zoom conversations, I think you have to take all of these kind of small details and put them together and then it'll be big. It'll be big in terms of people picking up what's in the face, knowing if you're interested on board, is something going to fly and move forward or is it just a bunch of static and people are putting out there, but there's no real joining in or traction happening in the meeting or in the conversation. Um, you know, the next one I want to talk about just meetings in general. Human beings tend to have certain motivations that drive us. And I know that's one of the questions is intrinsic motivations. And I'm kind of going to go there already. 
So one of them is we like to have some degree of autonomy. We like to defend our own identity, our own ideas. You want some chance to feel like you're not just being put upon or railroaded into a decision. We like to have mastery. We like to have a chance to learn, to grow. And if that is blocked for us, we will find it elsewhere. We want to belong. We want to have a sense of bonding with other people. Um, all of those I would consider intrinsic and the acquire as in titles, compensation, et cetera, may be more ex extrinsic, but it also ties into our sense of pride that we're making progress. Uh, controlling our lives and so forth. So all four of those motivations, I think when you look back and reflect on the patterns in your meetings, are you finding ways in which those four motivations are being met for people? And if they're not, I think you've got problems. Among the seven things I have here, they're pretty tactical, but again, I think in combination, they add up to something. You pass the baton, you give other people a chance to talk. You do maybe anonymous group poll so you can really get a sense of where people are at and they can do it in a way irrespective of perhaps feeling like they're the outsider or don't have the same stature as other people. If the meetings are boring uh, and they never get a high rating and review based on having them, maybe they should go away or be truncated. Uh, maybe two minute video updates can be as good or better in some cases. Uh, also, can you limit the number of meetings per day? Anything that goes on and on and on, uh, whether it's just one meeting or a series of meetings, eventually is going to leave us jaded. Uh, I mentioned the importance of visuals, so a digital whiteboard that people have something to concentrate on over and above words alone, I, I think is really important to making it work. Number five, I talked about loneliness. Um, can you find some water cooler moments? Maybe they're not happening literally at work, but why not make a one-to-one -one call, maybe to everybody on the team, for instance, or someone you think is lagging or his voice is not being heard as much. You know, whether you customize it or make it a standard protocol across the team, you know, sometimes a one-to-one -one conversation just gets you the chance to go a lot farther uh, than the group conversations. Is there a listening post where people can post things and, and see what's going on and get input that way? outside of the meeting itself. It's another chance for communication. Uh, I do think occasional in-person meetings. Uh, someone said to me the other day, well, we should think about it like the airlines, that you've got a hub and spoke model, and occasionally you actually want to come back to the hub. And maybe it's not corporate headquarters, it's someplace else, it's more informal, it's a geographic location that works for people. Uh, but I do think that there's a you know, in-person component that's nice to add back into the mix, even if by chance you go to a fully remote model, which I'm not sure companies are gonna uh, do all that often. Another thing in terms of avoiding sadness, which I think is the result of, of uh, loneliness and isolation, is remembering what makes people conversely happy. And a lot of that you can see is going to the inner ring here. Uh, is it meaningful? Do you feel like the work your team is doing uh, actually improves the company's fortunes, uh, it grows your sense of involvement and career path, maybe is helpful to society at large. Do you feel like you have a sense of belonging? I mean, that was one of those four motivations I showed a moment ago. That it's really, really important. And then I would guess I'd probably take security and order on the right side here and call it psychological safety. Um, do you feel like you have, you know, you're in a situation that has some order to it, but it also has fairness to it. Uh, that's going to increase the emotional comfort level. And all of us perform better, of course, when we have that comfort for us. Uh, the sixth one, pretty simple one, work-life balance. Uh, commutes used to be our chance to maybe transition. Now we could just spill over and work endlessly, seemingly. Uh, I think there's ways you can do literal, mental, motivational, psychological commutes, and it goes back to just getting your two feet uh, on the ground, away from the desk, outside, around the house, whatever the case may be. But we do need the breaks, and maybe some people, if they get obsessively involved with the work, just have to set out some structures for themselves. So I'm in favor of internal, almost spiritual commutes, if necessary, to relieve the sense of burnout. And the last one is, you know, making sure that you have visibility. Uh, I think probably my favorite approach here 
to make sure that you stand out in the crowd, you get noticed by a boss, that you have a pathway forward, is to develop an expertise. And I mean that on two levels. On the larger picture, maybe there is uh, a skill set that you particularly bring or that you develop over time. But I also like the idea that on a more tactical level, you have maybe a point of view that you're known for bringing to a, a topic, to an issue, uh, maybe a set of questions that you raise. Uh, one of my favorite bosses used to come back and always it was, let me ask a stupid question. Well, it was never a stupid question. It was the best question in the room that no one else had the guts to ask. So whatever you can do to brand yourself and stick out without being obnoxious, without disrupting the chemistry of the team, uh, I think it's a chance to show that everyone has different perspectives and different opportunities to contribute. So I think that's a way to, to tackle it. The last point I would make before we open it up to the Q&A is having done all this work for all these years, for all these companies, across all these continents and applications, it's amazing how much this holds up. There is, in facial coding terms at least, seven emotions that we can go after and capture and quantify. And what I've seen repeatedly is that anger and happiness constitute about 70% of most people's emoting. So yes, we want to be happy. <laughs> if we are happy, uh, we will brainstorm to superior solutions more quickly. We will be more open-minded, more open-hearted. It is a wonderful emotion. Anger is actually a constructive emotion if properly used. It means we want to make progress. We want to be in control of our destiny. Remember that I mentioned autonomy earlier is one of our key attributes. And then you have the other five, and they all have the role. But if you remember, for most people, to hug or to hit, happiness or anger is in simplest terms where so much of this game gets played, and the other emotions are kind of accent points. And so if there's nothing else you can take away from the presentation, that's my simplest boil down of what emotional intelligence means. And uh, now I'll turn it over to the questions. <laughs> 